Father, in the name of Jesus, we declare that we let it be known that you indeed reign, that you are King of kings and Lord of lords, that we have been fearfully and wonderfully made in your image. So we accept nothing less than your best today. We press in, we move to a place of believing your word, God, and acting like it is so. We live by the word, we breathe the word, we eat the word, we sleep the word, as it were, because the word is a part of who we are. So we declare that all those that see us have seen Jesus. We declare right now, Lord, that it is your life in us that causes us to be successful, causes us to be empowered, and to live victoriously in this earth. Thank you for your word. Let it be known that our God reigns. Can you give the Lord a shout of praise one more time? Hallelujah. Amen, amen, amen. God, God bless you. You can take your seats just for a moment here. We're going to take our seats. I'm going to just go ahead. Thank you, praise and worship team. You guys knocked it right on out the park as always. Amen. Give them some love. Will you do that? Boy, if that's the best love you got, man, I'm just saying, you know, can't you, don't you have me? Yeah. Amen. 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 We're delighted today. I'm delighted to be back with you. Um, I'm just thankful that God is God and that he's God. Everything is true that he says, and everything else is a lie. Amen. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Uh, uh, again, I'm going to go a little bit differently this morning. I just sense the presence of the Lord taking me a little bit different way, so we'll have our announcements. We'll receive our offering. A lot of people don't like it when I do this, but get over it. <laughs> amen. <coughs> if not, at least today. Amen. Delighted that you're here this morning. I'm certainly glad that each one of us, uh, if I could get some lights up here, that would be cool, and I'll just move forward from there. How you doing? Man, we've had some beautiful days, amen. Weather is, weather is changing and shifting more along to my liking. You know, I've endured a, a, a tough winter. How about you? Amen, amen, amen. Praise God. And all those from Alaska said it feels great, amen. <laughs> Glory to God. But we're delighted that you're here this morning as I look around the room. My wife and I were traveling on last week, and thank you for those of you that filled in and held up admirably and did an amazing job. Glory to God. I got way too many empty seats up front. Can I get some, some, some people who are not intimidated to sit up front? Can we do that? Um, just, you know, come on up front. And I don't know. I guess people are not here today. That's fine. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Come on up. Look at Father and Son in the house of God. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. Love it, love it, love it, love it, love it, <coughs> love it, love it, love it, love it. Uh, so I want to do uh, something here real quick. Cynthia, you can take note before you give our, our announcement on our Seder, which will come again. And we're going to do this at the end of the service, but I'm going I'm to take note now. Uh, Tina, if you would pass one of these to everybody, have your usher, your helps team pass one of these to everybody. This is something that I had printed off, um, and it's necessary for me to say this, and I want to say it um, when everybody gets one, and I'll get going on it, so you can just take it. We're not going to read through the whole thing. I just want it for your information purposes only, just so you can have good information. How many of you know good information is what helps us make good decisions? And so if we have, if we have garbage in, what do we get? Garbage out. Garbage out. And so uh, I know that's true, and it's, it's especially prolific, sad to say, but it's been especially prolific, I believe, in the body of Christ over the years. Our ancestors taught what they knew, and they taught what they learned, and so as Brother Hagen of old used to say, if, you know, grandma taught it and we bought it, but if it was wrong, it was wrong, amen? And so we've grown up with erroneous thinking and bad decisions have been made as a result. This is document that talks, and I just printed this offline, I got it from Wikipedia, it seemed like the best source for me, uh, on, on what our Passover Seder is all about. Here's why I said this, everybody look at me. If you have not signed up for it, please let, uh, please sign up if you're interested. We're about, uh, I think we're about a third of the way there. We've got approximately 30 seats. Um, if I cannot get more involvement, will not have it. If I cannot get more involvement, I will not have it. I believe most of you not involved or not signed up because you don't know what it is. Now, I'm hoping that $30 didn't scare you away. I paid 60 you feeling me? And it might be. I get it. I get it's a stretch for some people. I get that. But don't let that stop you from coming. If you really want to come, you don't have the money, you come see me. I, I'll get you in. Ain't nobody saying nothing. I was only gone one week, y'all. Amen? 
but this gives information regarding it, and it's good information. I've edited it myself to make sure there's a lot more there, but I just went ahead and made it concise so that you could understand it. Read about it. Uh, th the reason why I say this is contractually, once I obligate myself to this, we are obligated. And uh, it's going to be a big deal. Uh, Linda Edwards, I spoke with her on yesterday, and she is uh, excited about coming. Last year, this time, how many of you were at last year's Seder that we did in this room, right? And we said then that we were going to have one next year, and we said we were going to charge for it. Amen. Let's go back and watch the tape, amen? amen? So don't tell me you didn't know. Come on now. And we kept it as reasonable as possible. They wanted more. We negotiated them down. And this is what you're paying is not to go towards anything other than to pay for the meal. And then we've got some people that can't be here and have already paid for somebody else. So I want you to prayerfully consider that. Let me know. If it's a problem for you, let me know. We've got one more week. I will be in there talking to them uh, to go ahead and finalize things. But it is Friday, Good Friday. Amen. And we backed it off so everybody could come and have time to get in from work. Good Friday is the day. And oh, by the way, we will not have service here. Resurrection Sunday will not be in this facility. As a matter of fact, we will not be meeting on Resurrection Sunday, commonly known as Easter. Okay? We're not having Easter service here because in the hotel, just like last year, they've got this big deal that they've got planned. We are having our service on Saturday in this place. Saturday evening, not Saturday morning. Y'all come out Saturday morning, you're going to be here by yourselves. You can preach to yourself, it don't matter. Saturday evening. The day before, so you get Resurrection Sunday to take your mothers out, take your fathers out, go, go out and eat with your family. Go to another church. I don't care. Amen? Amen? Go do whatever. My wife and I last week, on last week, went to what was the first Presbyterian church in Iron Mountain, Michigan. So we were in church. Amen? Amen. And Rob and I haven't been to a church like that in a long time. But the message was on point. She said, ever. We've been younger. Come on, yeah. We've been a long time. And, but the message was good. Hey, man, I'm going in and out. I can't hear myself. So uh, the message was good. That's what you come for. You come for the message. Worship was good. It was really contemporary for that set. Did nobody raise their hands or clap their hands, but Pastor Nett and I were up here like this. You know, and, and the, our guests, yeah, I know, right? She said, I hope so. Our, the the guests that, that had us there, Pastor Steve and his wife, we were planning on sitting in the back. Y'all know how y'all do. Let me find the <laughs> furthest seat back so I can sit. And so they were like, uh, front row, here you go. So they brought us up front. We sat on, and, and uh, Steve Warner's young son, uh, Caleb, is a delight. <laughs> he kept me going all service long. And so I'm believing God for him and his family. Beautiful family, beautiful time. We had a great time, and it did refresh us. It was cold up there, but it was sure enough pretty. It was beautiful. Amen. It even started snowing on our way back, but praise God. Amen. Come on. Amen, somebody. Somebody say amen this morning. Put your hands together and give the Lord a hand of praise. <laughs> Glory to God. Hallelujah. I want to greet our YouTube audience this morning and any of our first-time guests. We're certainly delighted. This is LifePoint Christian Faith Center. We are located at 1221st Avenue in the city of Coralville, Iowa. How you got into this channel, I don't know, but thank God you're here. I trust that the Holy Spirit has led you to tune in, and I know that you're going to be blessed. I believe that there's some dynamic information coming, not because I'm speaking, but because the Holy Ghost and the Holy Spirit is leading us to say these things, do these things. Amen? So I'm just delighted that you're here. If this is your first time tuning in with us, take notes. Let us know that you're watching. We certainly appreciate it, and we want to know, want you to know that we've got a warm seat of welcome for you. If you're ever in the local area, we are located in Coralville, Iowa, uh, metropolitan, metropolitan area of Iowa City, Iowa, and we are here with a warm seat of welcome. We meet at the Radisson on the first Sunday evening as well. We will have an evening service tonight as well, 5 o'clock. So come on down if you're in the area. We'd love to have you. We've always got a warm seat of welcome for you. Would you just welcome our YouTube audience this morning, ladies and gentlemen? And as I look around, I see a few faces that I may not have seen before, so I certainly want to welcome you. Thank you so much for tuning in. Good to see some faces I haven't seen in a while. You know, you guys are real special. It makes church really special to come in here and see such beautiful faces. Give each other a hand of love. Amen? Yeah. Amen. Well, so you, you pray about the Passover Seder. You let us know. Let the office know. Please don't call me directly and say you coming or not coming. Please. I mean, you can, but I'd rather you didn't. Call the office. Get online. If you don't know how to get online, uh, fill out. Do we have any sign-up sheets anywhere around for this? I pray that we do. If not, we'll rectify that, won't we? ELT team. <laughs> Anybody saying nothing this morning? All right. 
Amen. So we'll get it right. We're certainly delighted for that. I want to go ahead. I want to get into this. Last time I was before you was about two weeks ago. Uh, it was two weeks ago, two, a couple Sundays ago. And the Lord had led me down uh, a path. And we were talking about uh, from restoration to harvest. And we're talking about the part one of that aspect of it. And I want to get into part two. And I don't have a lot of time today. So I want to make sure that I get this portion in. And then we'll get everything else taken care of as necessary. Uh, I'm going to invite you, if you would, to open your Bibles to Romans 12. My dear friend, uh, somebody you're familiar with, was here on last week, Pastor Randy Stone. I hope you enjoyed him. Randy's a very insightful brother. He really is, and Randy doesn't pull any punches. He fit, fits right in with LifePoint. Amen? Because I'm not going to pull no punches today either. Amen. I'm going to tell you once, at the beginning, get your religious toes. If you have to, cut them off. <laughs> cut them off. Amen. But get them out of the way, because we're going to tread through some stuff by the leading of the Holy Spirit this morning. Romans 12 is a very significant passage of Scripture. Who can tell me why? Somebody tell me why it's significant. It's in the Bible. That's one. Who else? Come on. Good answer. Come on. Why is Romans 12 significant? Come on. Come on. Come on. Somebody. I ain't saying nothing. Y'all need a mic in front of you to say it, or y'all just can stand up and say it? Tell me why. Showing the way Christians should live, I got. Who said that? Very good. Who Raise your hand. You should, be, you should be in service more. Amen. She is. She, she here, though. She here. Who else? Come on. That's two. Give me, give me two more. It, it deals with transformation. Okay? Thank you. Exactly. Transformation of what? Mind. Your mind. That's where I want to get to. The transformation of your mind. And I didn't, I didn't watch. I was un unable to watch last week's broadcast, but... Uh, I did speak with Randy after the fact. I spoke with him on Monday, and he just told me he was just delighted to be here, and he just thinks LifePoint is one of the greatest churches he's ever been in. And I agree with him, amen? I agree with him, amen? Uh, the, the, the number of your membership or partnership does not identify the, the magnitude of your influence in the earth. Amen. Hope y'all know that, amen? Hope y'all know that, amen? So in, in Romans 12, what Paul does, the Apostle Paul, and I'm going to read primarily from the Expanded Bible today, but the Apostle Paul, don't start my time yet, don't start my time yet. The Apostle Paul, what he does is he makes sure that we get, we as believers have come to an understanding that transformation is possible. That's a good place to start your Christian walk. Transformation is possible through, through re the renewing of your mind. And if you don't understand that, then the, then the things that you have caught, uh, brought into the kingdom, I'm going to call them baggage, whatever baggage you've brought into the kingdom, you will think that ultimately you have to keep for your entire life. Right. And it is absolutely not true. And I'm going to point that out to you today. So what you've got to understand is that the process of mind renewal is just that. It is ongoing. Say ongoing. ongoing. It does not stop just because you get born again. As a matter of fact, that's where it starts. And just because you grew up in the church like I did, maybe you grew up in the church like I did. Y'all know my story. I was, I was talking with Pastor Steve, and it was very, very interesting because I hadn't talked to him to this level, that, that he himself, uh, we're about, I don't know, we're about seven years apart in age, I think, thereabouts. But, but we had similar circumstances growing up in a pastor's home. His dad was a pastor. And I'm not going to tell his story. How many of you were in there heard his testimony when we were on the other side? Powerful, wasn't it? what God can do to a restored mind. I will tell this part. He spent time where nobody wants to spend time. And when I went out there to hit spread, and I do call it a spread, where's Linda? Linda, Linda and I were talking about living by the lake. He lived right by a little, by a little lake. And I'm, I'm like, look, that's, that's where I want to live. I just don't want to live in Iron Mountain, Michigan. You feeling me? It's a little too cold, a little too far up north. So give me something with a little bit of a southerly influence in terms of the weather, you know, Corville's nice. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. But my point is what this, man, what this man did was he allowed his mind to be renewed. Right. And it has nothing to do with your past. Right. The Bible says for all, I talked about this last time, for all have sinned. This, I'm just giving you a, a recap. All have sinned. Come on. Who in here did not sin? Now, now be careful because if I said this, who in here is a sinner saved by grace, everybody's hand would go up. Right? Because the way you were taught, most a good number, not everybody, but most people's hand would go up. You know, if I said that phrase, I'm just an old sinner saved by grace. Well, if you're an old sinner, then get saved by grace because you can only be saved one time. And once you get saved, you're done with, with the salvation part of it. I'm going to prove it to you in a minute. But you are not done with the mind renewal. Isn't that right? 
So all of those things come as, as assignments, and I don't want to get ahead of myself, that have really come to light to, to, to trip us up. Now, I want you to write this down. Hold your place in Romans 12. I'm not going to turn anywhere, but I want you to write this down. This is what the Lord ministered to me today, you know, just as, as I was, really, just as I was getting ready to head out the door. So I had to take a moment and write it down when I got here so I wouldn't forget. Many times the Lord speaks to us, and we get so busy we fail to write it down. Your memory's not that good. You need to write it down. I don't care. I didn't say you had a bad memory. I said it's not that good. So what he said to me, he said, Tommy, the Bible is not a book to live by. Mm. There's a religious cow. I'll fix it. The Bible is not a book to live by as much as it is a book to live. You got to live it. Don't live by it. You know what good Christians do? They live by the Bible. They, they, yeah, and, and, and really what happens is say it louder. We try to master the Bible. And what we do is we find ourselves trying to do something that, that is simply not possible for you to do. And I'm giving, trying to give lay this foundation so I can show you. And, and there's an instance in the Bible that, that Paul, the apostle Paul, caught Peter trying to live by the Bible. Or rather, by the law. We can say those two interchangeably. Can I not? Okay. The Bible, the Bible in the Old Testament is referred to as the law of God or the command of God. So what I'm saying to you is that we, it's easy for us to think that because we don't uh, smoke no more, drink no more, that we okay. And you may not be. And your brother or sister that's still token maybe and doing a little something that you would call sin may not be a sin for that person. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm, t- I'm telling you. Now, I'm not advocating any of that. But what I'm advocating is mind renewal. Because the worst place in the house is to be, I'm glad this seat is empty, to be a deacon sitting up front and you think you're okay, but you have not had a conversation and not been intimate with God in 30, 40 years. But your position makes you feel like you're okay. Are you feeling me? What did, what did, what did, the, what did one, in one place where the gospel says that uh, the, uh, one of the, one of the uh, Pharisees or one of the religious leaders says, Father, I thank you that I'm not like this man. Right. And we find that same spirit that creeps into the church to make us think we okay because we in the church. Yeah, that's true. Say amen to that. Yeah. All right. So the Bible is not necessarily or not a book to live by as much as it is a book to live. Can you say amen to that? Let's go to Romans 12 real quick. Let me not hold you there too long. Now you can start my time, please. Romans 12, verse 1 and 2 from the Message Bible. We read this last time. I'm not going to read it. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to read it real quick, and I'm going to keep on going, okay? So here's what I want you to do, Paul says. God helping you. Say, God helps me. He says, take your everyday, ordinary life. Do you see that? Everyday, ordinary life. That's living the faith. And you get up in the morning. And you decide, eh, I'm not sure, for some reason, I'm not sure I, I want that coffee. And you say, well, it's just coffee. But is it? Is it really? Yeah. Or could it be that the Lord is minister? Maybe you need to get out the house a little bit quicker instead of taking the time to drink the coffee. Yeah. That's your ordinary life. Yeah. Maybe you're at the intersection of, of First Avenue and 10th place, 10th Street place, and you want to turn left and something in, is just telling you. And we got to stop saying something told me. His name is Holy Ghost. Amen. Holy Spirit is telling me, I need to turn right. I don't know why. But maybe there was some danger to the left. I don't know. Are you feeling me? That's your ordinary life. Let's keep reading. So he says, uh, you're, you're sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life. Boy, that can't get any plainer. Okay, okay, let me keep going. And place it before God as a what? As an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing that you can do for him. Don't become, verse 2, so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without thinking. Instead, in other words, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Many of us recognize, but we don't quickly respond. Because we're not sure. We're not certain this is God. Can I tell you, if you were born again this morning, if you have confessed your sins, 
if you sin this morning before you got here, you are God's child. And he is speaking to you just like he's speaking to me. The difference is I believe it. I've trained myself to believe it. Stop trying to feel it. That's what most of us do, amen? Let's keep going. You'll be changed from the inside out, readily recognize what he wants from you, and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity. God brings the best out of you, develops well-formed maturity in you. It is not you, it is God in you, who, both to will and to do, Philippians 2 says, of his good pleasure. Stop taking credit for the stuff that you ain't doing. If I'm preaching the gospel, it ain't Tommy's doing, it's God's. And if I'm, if I'm coming up against the barrier of sin, I've got to be smart enough that, to know that it is Christ in me who is in my hope of glory, that I don't have to yield to it. But if I do, don't lie and say, I didn't sin. Yes, you did. Repent. All right, all right, all right, all right. I'm gonna, y'all stay with me, okay? All right, let's keep going here. I want you, now I'm, I'm going to write, just go through these real quick just for sake of those who weren't here before. The first thing we talked about last time was being transformed from old to new, right? Transformed from old to new. We just read it. It is, tra- it is a transformation that takes place on the inside, not the outside. A lot of people want to live from the outside transformation. You know, I, I grew up in a Pentecostal holiness, real strict Pentecostal holiness church, and some of the good old church mothers, they, they, I couldn't understand why they were so mean. When they look so pretty on the outside. Just because you're pretty on the outside don't mean you're pretty on the inside. But I didn't learn that until I got older. Until I got stepped on a couple times. Okay, all right. Number two, everybody needs restoration. Everybody needs restoration. Everybody needs restoration. Who is your favorite preacher? Kenneth Copeland, Dad Hagen, uh, Billy Graham. You know, you name it. I could go on the list. But all of them need restoration. Right? All right. Let's keep going. Glory to God. Number three, is God really in control? We asked this question last time. Is God really in control? A lot of people say he is. But you know when you find out whether or not he is when you get into a situation. If you get into a situation that's, that's challenging, if the first words out your mouth are, help me, Jesus, you probably, God's probably in control. Now, I'm going to say something, and if you're religious, you might get mad and walk out. I don't care because I, I, I warned you, and I'm warning you too. I'm going to say something that some of y'all ain't going to like. My wife says you need to be careful when you do this, but I'm going to do it. <laughs> if the first words out your mouth when you get in the jam are, oh, damn. Yep. 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 I did say that, right? Yep. Do I need to say it again? No. Then you probably, God's probably not in control. Because <laughs> Because what you say out your mouth is what you're going to get. You may not think so, but I know it's true. You do too. Say amen to that. So number three was, is God really in control? Let's look at number four real quick. Number four, we talked about the Israelites coming out restored. They were completely restored. They were hooked up. And I ain't talking about today's modern vernacular either. They had all of the gold and silver and the riches, rubies, fine, and all of the things. And, and, the, and the, the, the Egyptians gave that. Just get out. I don't care what you leave with. Just take this and get out of my country. I'm here to tell you that that's how God wants us. The world should be so inclined to just look at us and say, what is it about you? I don't know. I just got to bless you. And like it or not, you know, uh, when people have an issue with, with you because you, cause you tongue talking, you know, you know uh, hands raising, you know, maybe you got a little shimmy or shake, whatever you got, and they don't understand. They, they think it doesn't take all that. Look, it takes all that and then some for me, baby. Because I've come up against stuff I can't handle with just this natural mind. My mind has to be renewed because if it's not renewed, I know Tommy Roberts, he would give up on life. And those be the main ones calling you say, can you pray for me? All right, all right, all right. So the Israelites came out restored. This is where I want to begin this week. So beginning of part two is this. And, and, and just for sake of understanding, 
I got too many papers in front of me, but that's okay. I'm going to get there. I'm going to get there. Y'all right? Yes. All right. Glory to God. Stop it, Mandy. So, here's my subtitle today. So, we're talking about from restoration to harvest. This is part two, amen? So, this week's message or the subtitle is Know Your Enemy, Know Your Purpose. Know your enemy, K N O W. Know your purpose, K N O W. The, the church at large struggles, I said this last week, with an identity crisis or last time. Identity crisis. Anytime you do not know who you are, you are subject to be molded into anybody's image of you. And what you allow yourself to do is to be led by the, the whims and the desires of other people. That's why it is a dangerous thing to allow yourself to be married to somebody who you don't know. Or worse, worse yet, they don't know you. It took, it's taken all of 36, 37 years. How long have we been married, honey? We, how long have we been together? About 38 it's taken all of 38 years for me to get to know this woman of God. I would be a fool, an absolute pure D fool, as we would say back in the day, to somehow or another trade her in because I just don't like this model anymore. Because then what I would have to do is find out, number one, what, what broke in my mind to cause her not to be the one that God somehow or another has allowed to be the one for the last 38 years and think I'm going to start over with another one? Oh, my God, heck no. But it happens all of the time. I'm not throwing stones. I'm telling you that you've got to know who you are in fellowship with. You have to know those that are, are, are in your life. And first of all, when you not only do you need to know them, you need to know why they're there. A lot of people don't know why people are next to us. God help me. And when we don't know why they're there, guess what? I have a measure of distrust for you being there. Uh, uh, earlier, I don't know, I guess it was last year sometime, I said this, and I'm going to say it again. I go to bed. I shouldn't tell too much of my business. <laughs> Some of y'all can't handle this. Some of y'all can't handle this, but I'm going to be truthful because that's the only thing Jesus said would set you free. Amen. If you come in my bedroom uninvited, I have a safe on my wall that has an instrument of protection and or destruction depending on whether or not you're supposed to be there. Are you feeling me? I, I make sure that when I lay down, the safe is open. So I ain't got to get up where Kathy at in the middle of the night trying to punch in numbers. Because when I hear a noise and that dog raises it, oh, when that dog raises his head, my head is raised. Or if the Holy Ghost says, hey, I'm up. Now listen to me. I sleep with it open because I, I'm not worried about her. Some of y'all get that later. And she's not worried about me getting crazy and doing something foolish. Are you feeling me? Because we sleep under the peace of God. Because we know each other. Now, if you, can, if you don't trust the person around you, I don't recommend you. I don't recommend. I recommend you keep that joker locked and keep the combination to yourself. <laughs> okay. I'm just saying. All right. Let me, let me move on from there. All right. So, so but the, the challenges for people is, is they don't, because they don't know who, know who they are, they don't know why they were created. I want to show you a little bit of this. Can I, can I, can I go? Turn with me to Hebrews 8. Hebrews 8, glory to God. Help me this morning, Lord. Are you all right? Yeah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hebrews 8. And you're going to want to write this down because this is the reason why we turn that. We have a better covenant or agreement built upon better promises. That's what it says. We have a better covenant or agreement built upon better promises. Better promises than what? Than the Old Testament. Amen? 
When does the New Testament begin? Somebody tell me. Who said it? You always answer. I mean, <laughs> that's all right. The New Testament, listen to me now. Listen to me. Oh, Lord, I look at it like, what? Tell Robin to be quiet. Yeah, hush. Hush. The New Testament does not begin from the, from the understanding of these promises until the book of Acts. Some of y'all learned something today, right? Well, how do you know that? Because the New Testament could not be ratified until the Lamb of God, who was slain before the foundation of the world, placed his blood on the heavenly mercy seat. Yeah. He did not do that until after the crucifixion. Does that make sense to you now? So what I'm saying to you, when you read this book, let me borrow your book real quick. When you read this book, it's written as Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the New Testament. And rightfully so, based on the writing of it. Hear me well. But as far as the ratification or the enforcement of it, it does not begin until the book of Acts. That's important because of what we're getting ready to say. Y'all need to understand it, right? Y'all got that, right? Let's read it. I'm going to read it from the, amp, uh, from the expanded Bible, Hebrews chapter 8. Is that what I said? Verses 5 through 7. The work that they do as priests for the sanctuary in which they serve is only a copy and a shadow of what is in heaven. In other words, what they were doing, what the priests, the Levitical order was doing, was doing what they had seen by the leading of the Holy Spirit, by the imagery that they had, by what was given to Moses through uh, the, his time with God on the mountain, and this is what they began to do. Why did they do it this way? Because that's the way it's done in heaven. Yeah. All right? Okay, let's keep going. And a shadow, excuse me, and a shadow of what is in heaven. This is why God warned Moses when he was ready to build the tabernacle. He said, be very careful to make everything by the plan. Mine says plan or pattern or design that I showed you on the mountain, right? You can find that in Exodus 25, verse 40. But the priestly work or this ministry that has been given to Jesus, listen now, is much greater or far superior to the work that was given to the other priests. In other words, Jesus, once he accepts the rightful place of Lord and high priest, now his work is much more extensive than what they did. Because what they did was a type and shadow. What they did, look up at me, what they did caused you to have to come to the, to the, to the priest and, and repent annually. What they did was cause you to feel like you could never win because you got 364 days, as it were. You've, you sin, 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 and the weight of the sin keeps you so bogged down that you can't possibly see how God is in anything. You go up against enough obstacles. You may be young and strong and you ain't never had nothing happen to you, but wait until you get out here and somehow or another somebody threatens you with cutting off your lights and you ain't never had no lights cut off before. Or they, they come and say, you gotta, you, we, we don't need your services no more, and this is what you went to school for, and you, you, you did all this stuff for, and then you get in a situation, next thing you know, they tell you don't need you, or your wife don't need you, or your husband don't need you. Listen, you better know that there are better promises than what you've already seen. He says, I showed you on the mountain, but the priestly work, ministry that has been given to Jesus much greater, are far superior to the work that was given to other priests. In the same way, the new covenant, say new covenant, new covenant. right, that Jesus brought, uh, brought from God to his people, mediates, is much greater than the old one and the new covenant. Glory to God. And the new agreement is based, founded, legally enacted on promises of better things. There is a legal right for you and I to walk in sickness, I'm in, in, in health and healing. Yeah, you got to fix that one. There is a, but listen, listen to me. There is a legal right for the devil to enforce sickness over your life if you don't know the promise. And he will, he will do it. He will certainly try it. So he goes on to say, all God's promises are reliable, but these promises bring greater blessing. How many of you know it's greater to be healed than it is to be sick? If there had been nothing wrong with the first agreement or the covenant given to Israel through Moses at Mount Sinai, there would have been no need or reason to, for God to establish a second agreement. Right? The Mosaic covenant was insufficient. Please write that word down. The word insufficient somewhere in your Bible or mark it. 
the Mosaic Covenant was insufficient because it did not provide true forgiveness of sins. Boy, that's a good place to underline in your Bible. Because there is a true forgiveness of sins and there is a false forgiveness of sins. I know I'm right about it. Contrary to popular belief, the Bible does not contradict itself. The problem is that most people try to look at it from the, from the theology of their own mind and thinking. And when you try to enter into this book, you can't enter in this book with a carnal or an unrenewed mind. You might say something, well, I know God heals, but he doesn't heal everybody. Well, that's your theology, not God's. I can't tell you why he healed, why he, one is healed and one is not, because I don't know what that person that did not get healed is doing. And I don't necessarily know what that person that did get healed is doing. If you don't know that, you think God is unfair. Or he's just kind of randomly picking and choosing, hmm, let's see, I'm going to heal you today. Come on now. It's foolishness. Foolishness. Turn to 1 John 3. 1 John 3. Glory to God. Y'all all right? Thank you, Jesus. Make sure I didn't miss anything. I want to be deliberate. Thank you, Father. Yeah, I told you to write a better agreement, a better covenant built upon better promises, right? I told you to write that down. Write this down. God knows who we really are. The problem is we don't. God knows who we really are. The problem is we don't. For many of us. Some people do. But I'm a little concerned about the ones who say they do and then they turn around and do stuff that doesn't, that doesn't line up with that concerns me. I've done it. So have you. I just wasn't there to see it. Because we don't typically do those things in the light. And when you start talking bad about yourself, you ain't do it in the light. You have to step into darkness to do it. You having that pity party on your, because your emotions have hit, hit an all-time low? All of our emotions get low. Don't sit here and lie to me. I ain't never had emotional low day. Yes, you have. Keep living. You will. You say that prophetically? No, I'm saying that naturally. It's the truth. You will have a low day. You will have, because our emotions are, our emotions are a, a part of our makeup, but they are governed by the laws of the spirit. But if we're not renewed, if we don't have a renewed mind, we don't believe this with the book, then our, our emotions be all over the charts, man. Especially when it comes to social relationships. Mm, okay. This woman, I can only pick on this woman because this is the only woman I ever know. So, so you know, if, if she and I, we've had, man, I'm trying to think of the last time we had an emotional low day. I know it. But yes, that was you. That wasn't me. <laughs> I, yeah, I know. Um, it's, been, it's been within the last week, I know. It's good I can't remember. Good wasn't last night. That's good. <laughs> um, but, but, but the reality of it is anytime you lo live in close proximity to somebody, that's going to happen. I'm going to tell you another time it's going to happen when church people say they're going to do something and then don't do it. I'm preaching better than they say amen. Oh, I'll, I'll be there. I'll do that. You don't call. You don't show. And you expect somebody not to have emotional reaction to that. And what, listen, what we learn as leaders, what we learn is that we cannot be governed by our emotions. So I don't have a right. Look, she and I, we, I'm telling you, if, if I can work at it, she, she tells me this, and I don't care what y'all know because I'm telling y'all the truth. She, she tells me, you speak, you speak better to other people than you do to me. She's, tr she's telling the truth. I don't do it intentionally, but I don't have an emotional connection to them. In other words, you can't really get on my nerves. I live with her every day, 24-7, 365. If you see one, you usually see both of us. If she ain't with me, she downstairs in her office working. So what am I saying? Well, what happens is the emotional realm is the realm that causes most of us to be tripped up. There, there are people that did not come to church today because they didn't feel like it. There are people that did not show up in the house of God today because they feel guilty because they haven't shown up, because they haven't felt like it for so long. And you get, you get, and here's what happens. Here's what happens. Here's what happens. Uh, stand up, Kelsey. You, you sitting in that chair. 
Here's what happens. Stand, no, stand right here. Stand right here. I know, right? <laughs> turn, turn around, face me. Turn around, turn around, face me. Here's what happens. I want you to take a step back, okay? I want you, when I tell you to, I want you to take a step back. Here's what happens. His emotions don't feel good. Step back. Somebody ticked him off at work. He skipped three Sundays. That's three steps. Three steps. You just took one. Oh, that was a big, big step. Okay, I get it. All right. Yeah. One of his steps, because he's so tall, is equivalent to three of ours. Okay. <laughs> And you keep going, and you keep going, keep going, you keep going, and you don't mean to, you can't figure out, keep going, you can't open the door for him, you can't, you can't, <laughs> somebody know where I'm going, you know, keep going, and you don't mean to, come on now, you ain't meaning to skip church, you ain't meaning to not, wave bye bye to Kelsey, because you know what, he going out the door, and it's going to take a miracle of God to overcome the concern and the guilt and all the frustration to get him back in the door, say amen to that. Come on in, Kelsey. Give Kelsey a hand. You come back. <laughs> and this is what we should do when they come back. Y'all ain't hearing me this morning. We should welcome. We should be delighted to see him. Glory. God's son is back in the house. He made it back. She made it back. Devil was trying to keep him out there. And if he can keep him out there long enough, they might get cut off. That's living the word. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Let me keep going. I'm running out of time. So I said, God knows who we really are. The problem is we don't. Turn, what I tell you, 1 John 3, verse 8, expanded Bible. Anyone who continues to sin or sins belongs to the devil. Look up at me. Are you continuing to sin? No. But I sinned. That doesn't make you an habitual sinner. And what, what church has done is they taught us that if we make a mistake, life is filled with mistakes, baby. The only one who never made one was Jesus himself. Amen. Everybody else did. I'm going to show you one of the main characters that did. Glory to God. All right. Let's keep going. Belongs to the devil. Because the devil has been sinning since the beginning. Son of God, since the beginning, that when the Son of God came or was revealed, appeared for this purpose, turn it off, to destroy the works or the work of what? The devil. Remember what we said, you got to know who your enemy is, right? Verse 9, those who are God's children do not continue sinning because the new life from God or God's message or God's spirit which the Bible classifies as his seed remains or abides in them. God's seed is in you. When does it come? When we're born again. When we're born again. Mm. Boy, I just want to, I just want to, I, I just, I, I need to pause right there. Mm. I, okay. Yes, Lord, I'll do it. I, I, let me keep going. He says here, they are not able to go on sinning because they have become children of God. They are begotten or born of God. Verse 10, so we can see. In this way, it is apparent, evident, and revealed who God's children are and who the de devil's children are. Listen, how? Those who do not do what is right or practice righteousness, you see that? Practice righteousness. Practicing righteousness does not mean that you get it right every time. It means you're working on it. Now, to be clear, don't come up to me and say, well, pastor, you know, please be patient with me. God is still working on me. God is not finished with me. Please be patient with me. There's an old song. Please be patient with me. God is not through with me yet. Well, when are you going to get through? And what's the holdup? What's the holdup? No, I want to answer. What's the holdup? What's the holdup? I like, I like that one. Who said it? Who said mind? Thank you. She's paying attention in class. The mind is why you say that stuff. Not reality. When God looks at you, when he looks at Janice, he doesn't see any of Janice's past, could care less about it, and she got one. 
She just look good wearing it now. <laughs> Amen. But if the only person who can unlock her past, God help me, is her. Yeah. Right? You got to forget all that stuff. The Apostle Paul said, forgetting those things which are behind, looking to those things which lay ahead, I press, right? So we got to press. Let me keep going. <laughs> Glory to God. And he says, and those who do not love their brothers and sisters are not God's children or not from God. Now, that's all of you guys love God, and you love his children, don't you? I said, don't you? Turn to Psalm 139 for me so I can begin to try to conclude this and prove it to you a little bit better. Psalm 139. da 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 Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. 139th Psalm. Praise God. You got it? Say amen. All right. I will praise thee for what? I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works. And listen, listen. Don't let this become religious to you. And that my soul knoweth right well. What is your soul? Y'all got it. My mind knows that I am fearfully, wonderfully made. Hallelujah. My will knows that I am fearfully and wonderfully made. My emotions know, even though they try to lie to me, that I am fearfully and wonderfully made. So when I get down and... The weight of life is trying to hold me back. Grandchildren don't know how to act. Well, mine do. But children don't know how to act. Mine do. Uh, you, you know, you, huh? Money don't look right. Body ain't acting right. Wife is acting crazy. Husband acting silly. He just lost his mind. You still have to know that I am fearfully and wonderfully made, and this my soul knoweth right well. So when your emotions want to speak, you need to put them, you need to shut them up. One of the biggest problems of Christianity is complaining. Complain. Preach and preach too long. Complain. That brother preached as long as I did, and he didn't move. Occasionally he'd do the. I ain't knocking him, he was good, but he didn't move. I thought to myself, I told her, I said, I'd have worked up three sweats by now. But whatever your complaint is, is not valid. And if you have something to complain about, it's your fault. Uh-oh, that don't go over well. Because ultimately, if she left me and I didn't want her to leave, I ain't going to complain. I'm going to pray. I might get mad, but the Bible says be angry but don't sin. And when I move it from just anger into complaining, I have sinned. I better come over to this side. Cause. And so what we have to do is we have to learn and remember, according to the psalmist here, verse 15 says, my substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes didn't see my substance, yet being unperfect. And in thy book, listen now, all my members were written. Not just your physical members, but your spiritual accomplishments have been there, are there. Amen. You didn't just get born just to come to church Amen. or to be saved, right? He says, which in continuance were fashioned when as it yet there was none of them. In other words, you hadn't accomplished the thing, but God already saw you victorious. Amen. Did not one person in here say, tell your mama when you in your mama's womb, mama, mama, um, Put my finger on my wrist, please. On my, on my, mama, 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 mama. Because your mama couldn't do it. You didn't tell the doctor. Doctor, I don't like the color of my hair. I can see that my hair is going to come out this color. I want another color. Right. You had nothing to do with that. Right. Uh-oh. Say, uh-oh. uh-oh. You didn't get to pick your gender. Let me read this from the Message Bible. I'll move on. <laughs> Not that I'm scared of the topic. Now, don't get me wrong. Well, I'm trying to get somewhere else. Because you can change the color of your hair. You can get new teeth. 
You can enhance other parts of your body. But you can't change who you are. From the Message Bible, same, same passage. Oh, yes, you shaped me first inside then out. You formed me in my mother's womb. I thank you, high God. Your breathtaking body and soul, I am marvelously made. I worship in adoration. What a creation. You know me inside out. You know every bone in my body. You know exactly how I was made bit by bit. How, was I, how I was sculpted from nothing into something. Like an open book, you watched me grow from conception to birth. All the stages of my life were spread out before you. The days of my life were all prepared before I even lived one day. Can I tell you that, you, oh my God. Ecclesiastes lets us know that eternity is written in our heart. God has performed the work in your life. You cannot add anything to it. And you can't take it away. Why do I know that? Because the Bible says that the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. In other words, if you were called to be a teacher and you decided to just be a street sweeper, that's your choice. But if God calls you to influence some other, somebody's lives as a teacher, you are out of place. You need to repent and get into your calling. Well, I'm 70 years old. Well, you're still breathing. Y'all all right? Can I keep going? I got just a little bit more. Thank you, Lord. Number seven. Or not, excuse me. Excuse me. Don't, don't write the number. That's my number. Just write this down. What you don't know about you, what you don't know about you, absolutely must, you must know to be successful. Or you must learn to be successful. What you don't know about you Absolutely, you must learn to be successful. In other words, if you don't know who you are, you'll never be successful. I'll tell you why. Where is it at? Let me make sure I got it written here. I want you to just write some scriptures down. I'm not going to turn to all of them, but I want you to write them down for reference, okay? Because I want to make sure that you understand that I know what I'm talking about by the Holy Ghost. Write down Mark 4:15. Mark 4, 15. John 10, 10. And typically I don't just use single scriptures, but I'm not studying teaching from that, but these are emphasis. John 10, 10. 2 Corinthians 10, 4 through 5. I'm sure I will turn to that one. I might. 2 Corinthians 10, 4 through 5. And Ephesians 6, 12 through 13. One more time. Mark 4, 15. John 10, 10, 2 Corinthians 10, 4 through 5, Ephesians 6, 12 through 13. Glory to God. Yes, sir. Okay. I want to I make this statement to you, and I know that some of you are, are, may not fully understand it, but trust me, we, we got some time. We're going to spend, not today, but we'll get into it. There is positively and emphatically there is. Say there is. There is a messenger of Satan that has been assigned to keep you from succeeding. Listen, over your life, over my life, there absolutely is. How many of you believe that you have a guardian angel? How many of you believe and know that you have more than one? Okay. Then you better know that you have a messenger of Satan to keep you and I from succeeding. I'm going to show it to you. I'll keep going. I know. Write it down. 2 Corinthians 12, <clears throat> verse 1 through 10. I'm going to read this quickly. He says, this is Paul talking. I must continue to brag or boast. It will do no good. But I will talk now about visions and revelations from the Lord. I know a man, verse 2, in Christ, a believer, who was taken up, caught up, snatched away to the third heaven. The third heaven is, is definitely and most assuredly the presence of God. Okay. He says, when did this happen? 14 years ago. I do not know whether the man was in his body or out of his body, but God knows. And I know that this man was taken up or caught up to paradise. Again, another name for heaven. You can find that in Luke 23 and 43. I don't know if he was in his body or away from his body, but God knows. Listen, he heard things he is not able to explain or inex inexpressible, things that no human is allowed to tell. Verse 5, I will brag or I will boast about a man like that. What is he saying? 
the man in the spirit is much more worthy of boasting. If there's any going to, going to be any boasting, it's about the man in the spirit or the spirit man, not the natural man. Now, this is the same man who says, I count not my life to be my own. But the life that I live, I now live by the faith of the Son of God. In other words, the physical accolades and accomplishments of my intellect and my mind, my physical prowess, I might be able to, you know, to do things on a court or on a field or on a track or whatever. I might be able to solve the most witty of problems and do all of these things, cure diseases by my intellect. But that does not compare to the man that I'm getting ready to say is all important. Amen? He goes here, he says, verse 5, I will boast about a man like that, but I will not brag about myself. In other words, he doesn't even see it as himself, except about my weaknesses. Many of us hide behind our weaknesses, and it paralyzes us and keeps us from doing God's will because we don't know how to do it. I didn't know how to even get to Iowa until I moved here. I needed help getting here. I needed a GPS. I needed a map. I did not know how to get here. She didn't know how to get here. Matter of fact, we got separated on the road, and they were lost. She and my youngest son were lost, or they knew where they were. I knew where I was, but we was lost to one another. I didn't panic because I knew that God was taking me to Iowa. As long as I know the will of God, I know that the purpose of God is to get me to Iowa. Are you feeling me? So instead of my emotions going all helter skelter, oh my God, oh my God, what are we gonna do? I don't know what we're gonna do. We need to call the police. We you need to call on Jesus. Yeah. Verse six says, "But if I wanted to brag about myself, I would not be a fool. Uh, except about my weaknesses. But if I wanted to brag or boast about myself, I would not. I would not be a fool because I would be telling the truth." But I will not brag about myself. I will spare you, <laughs> glory to God, from this because I do not want people to think more of me than what they see me do or hear me say. Uh, or because of these extraordinary revelations, he says. Listen, verse 7, so that I would not be, listen, so that I would not become too proud of the wonderful things that were shown to me. Or because of these extraordinary revelations, he says, he says that there was given me, given to me a painful physical problem. I'm gonna fix this so I'm not yang gonna be no more distortion of this scripture in this house. Okay? It says a thorn in the flesh was given to me. This problem was what? A messenger from Satan sent to torment, harass, trouble me, and keep me from being too proud. Whatever the ailment was, whether it was some say he was, had some problem with his eyes. Or, I've heard all kinds of people. You had to say all these kind of things. It was a messenger from Satan. So what if it was sickness? It had to come from Satan. It couldn't have come from God. Well, why couldn't it come from God? Where God going to get sickness from? When he sent Jesus to destroy it. Where are you going to get it from? He going to let somebody come to heaven with sickness and then say, okay, let me use your sickness against uh, Tommy. No. Yeah. <laughs> Verse 8, I begged the Lord three times to take this problem away from me, that it might leave me. Verse 9 says, but he said to me, this is what God said to him, my grace is enough for you. All you need, it's all you need, my God. When you are weak, my power is made perfect in you. Right? My power is perfected in weakness. God doesn't need your strength. Most of us try to be good Christians. A good Christian. I'm going to do this because I'm a good Christian. And in your good Christianity, you start getting proud or you start recognizing how much you gave to the offering. I gave so much to that building fund. You being a good Christian. You're not supposed to give it by your strength or your bank account. You're supposed to give it by faith. Verse 9 said, verse 10 said, so I am very happy to brag about my weakness. What are you weak in that you don't tell nobody? Mm. Uh, that's a, yeah. Then Christ's power can live or reside in me. For this reason, I am happy 
when I have weakness or insults, hard times. Some of y'all get mad when y'all get insults. And you know what? The insults keep coming. Every time you get mad, they keep coming because you have given them avenue into your heart. And any weakness that the Lord find, oh God, any weakness that the enemy can find in you that you have not shored up by faith, he will exploit it until you, until you just lose your mind or lose your confidence in God. I'm going to tell you a good realm, he uses money. I'm going to be real. I got, my time is almost up. Money is a weakness for a good number of people that you and I know. I know it to be true. You ain't going to say amen. And when, when the devil can use, <clears throat> he finds that weakness in you. Uh, what he does is he in, exerts by the power of those that are assigned to dis disrupt your life, by that demonic presence, they put pressure on your money. When you have pressure on your money, it affects how you live your life. Because the first thing it starts telling you is that you, not, you don't have enough, God. Anytime you think you don't have enough of something, you try to start. And, 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 and what you do, you're not even knowing it because ain't nobody told you this. You think that somehow or another, you got to save it because if you don't save it, nobody else will. Now, I'm not talking about not having a savings. That's foolish. You should have a savings. What I'm saying to you, though, is that when it comes to any weakness in my life, the exploitation of it or the, 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 the pressure of it or the stress of it is not from God. God never comes to you and say, give, give. But what the enemy will do is he will come and he will say, don't give. And a blinder will hit your mind. And you don't know why whenever they begin to receive the offering, all of a sudden you get this funny feeling about you. And it's been there, it's been there as long as you can, well, oh God, help me this morning, as long as you can remember, but because you don't know it's a weakness in your life, and every time, listen, don't get it twisted, don't you think for one minute, now there is, there is clearly apostolic authority in this house. In other words, what I mean by that is there is not, not one devil going to raise up in this house and do nothing contrary because I ain't going to have it. I'm just not going to have it. But what he will do, if he came in assigned to your life, if he's sitting next to you and you can't see him and, and he, you've given him more authority than you've given the power and the presence of the angels of the Lord, that enemy will still be step, sticking, stabbing, pushing, twisting, bugging your ears, getting you distracted because you he wants you to do anything but be free of your weakness. And it ain't got to be just money. It'd be anything. Let me hurry up, kid. Write, write down Acts 20. I'm not going to go there. Acts 20, verse 21 through 24. I got to close. I got to close. I got to close. I am going to say this passage. The Apostle Paul, let me say this. Apostle Paul was, this is where the Apostle Paul has been warned by a prophet. He's at a prophet's house by the name of Agabus. And this prophet has two daughters who are prophetesses. But then women aren't supposed to do anything in the church. I don't understand that. Why is it in the Bible? And so, 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 but they've told the, listen, they've told the apostle Paul repeatedly, they've come in and one saw his garment and one saw his scarf and they kind of just wrapped it around themselves. Am I right? Somebody help me out. And, 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 and so Paul is on a mission though. He's mission minded. He's mission minded. He's got to do what he believes God's will is, but it is, listen, but it is not God's will for him to do it at this time. So he overrides it. So he comes, he comes in verse 23, that same passage, 23 says, he, uh, verse 22 says, and now behold, I go bound in the spirit. Do you see where he's bound at? He is not constrained in the natural because in the natural he can go and come as he pleases. We've got more people that go and come as they please, but they're bound up in the spirit and don't even know it. It's called deliverance. That's why we need deliverance. Every time you get ready to come to church, you decide, well, you know, I've been a light point for, for six years. Now it's time to move to another church. You are bound in your spirit. I know I'm right about it. I don't care what you say. Every time you skip three services and come to the fourth, you, you know, and you ain't got no reasonable excuse. You're just sitting at home doing nothing. The devil is stealing from you because he is exploiting your weakness. 
Oh, God, I wish I could get a better amen. That's okay. So, so he says here, save that the Holy Ghost, verse 23, witnesses in every city saying that the bonds and afflictions abide me. In other words, same man that just, read, just wrote this over in 2 Corinthians is now writing this. He's saying that these bonds and afflictions are always present with me. What has he done? He's learned to live with them. And yet he's supposed to overcome them. Oh, y'all can't imagine that the apostle Paul would be like this. Why not? He's just a man. Okay, all right. Ain't no spirit of religion going to come in here. I ain't going to have it. Verse 24, but none of these things move me, he says. Now, here he's coming back around to, to sanity. Neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify, testify the gospel of the grace of God. Now, you need to write out there Galatians 2.20. The reason why I say that is because what he began to realize is that these people are not wrong. I'm going to go through, I'm going to have to go through some stuff. Yeah. And whatever I go through is not God's fault. Amen. When you disobey God, whatever you go through ain't his fault. Yeah, yeah. Psalm 23. I don't turn it, just write, I just write it down. The Bible says that the Lord prepares a table. Somebody tell me where? Before me. Where's he talking about? Right here. Why do we know that? Because ain't no enemies in heaven. Easy enough, right? So if he's preparing a table before you, and he's not just talking about the folks that don't like you because they ain't invited to your banquet. But the ones that are assigned to steal, kill, and destroy for you, John 10, 10, are relentless. They are relentless. Yeah, amen. She right, because I'm going to tell you why. If you, look at, if you look at 2 Corinthians 10, verse 4, <laughs> and I wasn't going to read this one, but it's there. So I'm, 2 Corinthians 10, verse 4. We've taken it and we've, we've pulled down strongholds in the spirit realm. But that's not, that's not, that's not correct. Okay, yeah, I got a lot of blank stairs. Turn, turn to 2 Corinthians 10 for me, please. You got it up here. For the weapons of our warfare are not, what does carnal mean? Fleshly, physical. But mighty through who? God to the pulling down of strongholds. Okay, now let me ask you a question. If God has placed all things under his feet or under our feet, why are we pulling down strongholds in the spirit realm with this verse? We not. Paul's not even indicating that. He's not even indicating that. Give me the next verse. Give me verse 5. For though we walk... That's, that's 5. Okay. Go back one. Go back one. Thank you for being staying with me. Pulling down of strongholds, right? Now 5. Casting down what? Imaginations, Imaginations are not spiritual. They're soulish. They're soulish. So if the, the Bible says that as a man thinks in his heart, so if I think that my money's all jacked up so I can't give, it is. As long as I'm thinking it. If I think that, you know, all men are dogs, they are. Because you're thinking it. If, if I think people can't be trusted, I had somebody tell me one time at this church, said, Pastor, I don't, I don't trust you. I said, you in the wrong spot. <laughs> Ain't no way you can be blessed. That same person came back a few weeks later and said, you know what? It was me. I was just thinking wrong. I was like, praise God. I've been praying for you. You feeling me? Pulling, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Can I tell you a high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God? A high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God is saying that I'm going to, I always get the flu. That's a high thing. This pain that, that, I don't know, hits a particular area. Oh, it's a heart attack. Notice I grabbed this side, not this side. Some of y'all missed that. My heart ain't on this side. Pain hits you, and next thing you know, or you get something going on, you know, I don't know. It's a high thing. So if I'm doing warfare, I'm not doing warfare against what God has allowed. Mm, God. I'm doing, I'm doing, I'm engaging in battle against the things that my mind is trying to create because I got this demon pushing and pressing his will, trying to press his will against my thinking. 
So now I got to buy the authority of God in the name of God. I do this. I walk, you know, I haven't done it in a while, but if I walk downstairs where she can't see me sometimes because I, I want to keep up, maintain my image. I want her to think that I'm the best man she ever married. I want to think that I got it all together. She would say, well, what are we going to do? I said, baby, I got it. Don't know what I'm going to do. But I go downstairs and all of this pressure is trying to rise up and all of this high thing. What are we going to do about the church? By the authority of God in the name of Jesus, Tommy, you stop thinking that you're going to fail. You stop thinking that God has not already mapped out the plan stop thinking now I pull it down I cast it down cast down the imagination of not being who God said I am you pushing and I'm pushing back baby the Bible says that if I submit myself therefore under the mighty hand of God due time he will exalt me but he also says resist the devil Submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. But put the scripture back up. But I got to make sure that I'm doing it in accordance with what his word says. Give me, give, me, give me one more. And bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Leave it there. And listen, and having in readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. In other words, once I go into, into I put on the, the battle garments and the array of praise, praise is a weapon of war. I don't feel like praising, but I say, hallelujah. My God, I'm downstairs. The dog is looking at me like I'm crazy. So he just lays down because he doesn't want to get here. He don't want to get in the way. By the authority of God, I declare that I've been called to this city, this community, to bring about a change in the minds of men by the authority of God. Some of y'all walk around, oh, oh God. I, better, I got one more. Can I do finish this last one? I'm done. I'm out your way. So we established that he prepares a table for us in the, in the presence of my enemy. John 10 says, the thief cometh not but to steal, kill, and to destroy. We just read 2 Corinthians 10. And we know what Ephesians 6 says. Verse 12, 13. Don't we? We should. If we don't, we should. We recognize that. Turn with me one last place, and I'm going to close with this. Second, excuse me, Galatians 2. I told you I was going to show you one of the big time, one of the, one of the true apostles. He was big time, and there's no denying that. Galatians 2. Go down to verse 11. When you have it, say amen. But when Peter was come to Antioch, now who's writing here? The Apostle Paul. I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. Now listen, listen, listen with your ears as you read. Listen with your ears. He says, I challenged him because he needed to be challenged. Look at me, Aaron. I corrected him because he needed to be corrected. At this time, Paul was not the significant person that we know him to be now. If, if anything, he was a fledgling apostle. God help you. He was somebody that did not even, was not even in the presence of Jesus in a physical sense. This is my Peter. I'm, I'm Paul. And this Peter walked on water. God. Yeah, I hear what I'm saying. This Peter was there and witnessed and betrayed Jesus. This Peter was in the Garden of Gethsemane and raised his sword to cut off the ear of the guard. And Jesus reminded him, hey, hey, hey. But he was with him. This Peter stood up on the day of Pentecost, help me God, and began to proclaim the gospel in a way that mankind had never heard before. And he said, these are not drunk as you suppose. My God. It was Peter who had seen and witnessed the transfiguration of Jesus Hallelujah. And Paul said he needed to be challenged. Y'all got it? What had Paul done? Nothing. Oh, I better get out of here. Let, let, let's keep going. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. Okay, okay. <laughs> what verse I leave you at? But when Peter came to Antioch, I was stood him to the face because he was to be plain. For before that certain came from James. Now listen now. Before the people of faith came from Jerusalem, he was eating with the Gentiles. He was eating unclean food. 
He was doing things that did not represent Christianity. Or was he? Or was he? Come on, don't just agree with me because I say it. Or was he? He was actually walking in liberty because no, huh? He wasn't following Jewish law or Judaism. Listen now, you see the picture? So he's been set free by the Almighty. He's free to do what eat whatever he wants to eat. But his mind told him. So when Paul walks in the room with all these people that came from the Apostle James, and Peter gets caught with, 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 with a, a spare rib in his mouth, so to speak, he didn't know what to do. So you know what he did? He went back to the way he used to think. And he tried to hide the fact that he had been sitting there chowing down with the Gentiles, man. But he had every right to do it. So Paul wasn't calling him out because he was eating good in the neighborhood. He called him out because he was hiding and lying to himself and allowing the devil to trick him into thinking that somehow, now he's like, man, we don't even, we don't make the Gentiles become Judaizers. Why are you trying to act like you don't, don't eat with them? He did eat with the Gentiles, but when they were, when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself. Why? Fearing them which were of the circumcision. In other words, verse 13 says, and other Jews disassembled likewise with him, listen, insomuch that Barnabas, Barnabas, Paul's preaching buddy, got caught up in it too. If they get caught up in it, you and I certainly are susceptible to it. We start acting like, you know, well, that's sin. Thank you, because I showed him right there. It might be for you. Oh, I'm just looking at toes now. I like those shoes. I'm just looking at toes now. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm looking to see. Look, I'm looking to see. I like their toes, but I'm looking to see what size they got. See if I can. No, I'm just kidding. I thought it, I thought it was a sin to drink. Don't say nothing. Don't say nothing. Don't you say nothing. Don't say nothing. Don't say nothing. If it is, show it to me in God's word. And don't you dare pull it out of context. It is absolutely not good. And most people should never touch it. But the Bible says that what? Huh? Says that too. What else? Being drunk, which is... Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, see, y'all got religious on me. See, 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 see. You had, you got, I'm, I'll say it about smoking. Smoking is a vile thing that helps you meet Jesus sooner. Yeah. Potentially, for sure. Yeah. Now, you know when it is a sin? When God tells you not to do it. But don't you dare, don't you dare, don't you dare. You pull your little Holy Ghost special shoes in, the ones that you wear to church and only church because they holy, you holy, you got your little holy bandana on, whatever you got, I ain't looking around who I'm just saying, whatever it is, you got your holy suit on. Don't you dare condemn somebody that comes in here that might have an issue with smoking or drinking or, or whatever because they don't know what you know. And then when you start running around like you, oh, you know, I, 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 you know I'm delivered, but you wasn't always delivered. Let me, let me finish because I'm way, way over time. First, verse 14 says, but when I saw that they walked, what? Even Barnabas got caught up in this foolishness. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the what? Truth of the gospel. You need to underline that in your Bible. Please understand the truth of the gospel. I'm not advocating any of those things. But what I'm telling you is that what we call sin all the time, we've got a whole list of things that we call sin. Make sure that your list match up with the truth of the gospel. And not something you just parroting, amen? I said unto Peter, before them all. In other words, he called him out right in front of everybody. Again, this big giant apostle. If you being a Jew live after the manner of Gentiles, in other words, eating their pork, and not as do the Jews, why compel us the Gentiles to live as the Jews? In other words, why are you trying to get them to live like you when you ain't even living like them? You, you, you ain't even living up to it. And most of, in this room, most of us in this room, I started out by saying, most of us do more. What we do is we, we try to live by the Bible instead of living the Bible. 
Got to keep rules. Got to keep regulations. Got to keep, got to keep. Got to stay right here. Got to stay. I know. Bible says narrow is the way that, lead, you know, that, that leads to heaven. You know, broad is there. I know Jesus said that. But listen, baby, I already established to you that if you are not, if you're born again, you are not a habitual sinner. Let me, let me close it up because I said I was going to finish here. Verse, verse 16, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus, right? Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by what? The faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Verse 18 is so important. Somebody say, well, that sounds like one saved always saved. Not according to verse 18. That if you read it without that, I guess you, I guess you could draw that conclusion, but it's not true. And I could go further, but I'm not. Verse 18 says, for if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. Now, let me put that in modern day English. If the Lord tells you that you should not be, now there's, <laughs> oh, I love how religious people get, man. They start, start filling in the blanks. And, but doesn't the Bible say this? Yeah, I know what the Bible says. I fully know what the Bible says. I know, know what I've studied. I don't know what you've studied, but I know what I've studied. And whatever, right, exactly, whatever the Holy Spirit reveals to me to be sin is sin in my life, whether, whether it's in the Bible or not. You know, there's some movies that I should not watch because they're sinful. And they're perfectly legitimate to be watching on Netflix. Perfectly allowable by, by you know, the fact that I'm an adult. I can do whatever I want to do. You sure can. But if you're born again, your life is not your own. You gave up those rights as soon as you said yes to Jesus. You gave those right, that right up. Now, what do I mean by that? What I mean, close your Bibles, close your Bibles, close your Bibles, close your Bibles. What I mean by that is this. <clears throat> because I have an enemy and I know it, I have to learn, as much as I learn about God, I need to learn as much about him as I, as, as I can. That's why people, people always astound me. They say, well, I don't like to fight. Well, let's be clear. The war is over. The war is over. The war has been won. Jesus won that on the day of his crucifixion, really before the foundation of the earth, but he, he, he enforced it then. But there are battles that go on every day. How do I know that? Because there's many of you that sit in church, even this church, many churches, but even this church, and you sit in church and you still don't know what you're supposed to be doing for God. I don't know. Somebody asks you, what do you do? I don't know. I don't know. What are you supposed to do? What are you called to do? I don't know. I don't know. And it's like, okay, wait a minute. You're born again. How long have you been? You've been saved 20 years and you don't know what you're supposed to be doing for God? Then my question would be, what are you doing? Not, not condemn you because you say you don't know. I mean, that's not good. You should always be ready to give an answer to them that, that, that ask of the faith that lies within you. Peter, that same Peter wrote that. Why am I born again? Why am I saved? Because I, I love the Lord and I get to bring people back from a place of bondage into salvation. That's why you have a vision of your life. Now, <clears throat> I can say this about me because somebody asked this question in one of our uh, team meetings. I wasn't there, but it related to me, and I get it. That's fine. Can I tell you, <clears throat> this is a vision. It is a vision. Why is it a vision? <clears throat> because it gives me something to see and to attain to. I'm going to ask this question. You cannot answer it. None of the ELT can answer this question. Anybody else is feel free to answer. Out of this whole vision, this whole vision, right, these buildings, renderings, Thank you, Mandy. Mandy Mobley did raise your hand. Mandy did a great job with this. Amen. Give her a hand. Give her hands. Okay. <laughs> Out of all this, all, all this, I'm going to see how much, how well you know your pastor. What's the most important part of, part of this to me? I don't want nobody in the front row to answer because y'all should know anyway. Nobody in the front row. And that's you either. No ELT. What's the most important part of this? Say it louder. The, that's the most important part to me. This is great. I could care less in this regard. Are y'all feeling me? If I never see this, and I will, you know why I will? Because the Bible says that if I write the vision, it will come. And this is just a rendering. This is not. So, so if you get up and hear me talk, and I don't necessarily talk about this, I'm always talking about this. Because that's what God sent me to Iowa for. Anybody can build a building. Not everybody can reach men and women. Are you feeling me? So don't let anybody lie to you and say, well, you know, they're trying to build this. We ain't trying to do nothing, first of all. We're doing it. The Bible says about Jesus that he was the living word. And you and I are the living word. I said we are the living word. We do know this, right? So if, if, 
if in my lifetime I don't see this, I will see this. I guarantee you that. Now, I'm responsible. It's first Sunday. So I'm responsible for talking about all of it. I didn't intend that. I'm just kind of segue to that. That just kind of fit what I was going to say. But what you and I have to do is we, we have to just start doing something. I speak to you because the Lord has laid you on my heart. And I've said this to you before. You are a man of influence. You are a man of influence. Can you hear me okay? I know you do. And your influence has not waned because you've reached another level. Now, everybody know what I mean by level? Okay. Because we don't actually age. We level. We level up. Amen. And if you reach level 120, which God promised to all of us, if you, want, if you can attain unto it, praise God. But if you only reach level 99, praise God. But because of your, because of your former thinking, God has now renewed you. It's almost as if God, I can't walk over there because of feedback, so I'm standing right here. But it's almost as if God has just taken your thinking and just, and you're knowing now more than you ever realized you could about God. And it started with something that you thought was from him, but realized later was not. He's laughing because he knows I'm telling the truth. Amen. And since that time, saith the Lord, that your heart has been just tugging on it. Your heart's been pulling on God's coattails. Give me more God. Give me more God. Because you're starting to see it. Now, I say this to all of y'all. I don't know what your church background is. Life point is relative nine years in, be nine years soon. But I'm going to tell you, ain't a whole lot of churches running around teaching this kind of stuff to y'all. I'm just telling you the truth, okay? You know, I'm all into Sunday school and all those things, but we ain't got that here. We just don't have, I'm not going to apologize for things I don't do. <clears throat> what I will say is that you need to be empowered. You need to take the word that you have and live it every day. Don't be religious. Don't say, well, you know, we got to get up at five and pray. Say, you know what, honey? What's the Lord saying? What, what did he tell us to do today? And, and, and rightfully so, she going to ask you. You the man of the house. She lets you be, but you the man of the house. <laughs> and so you say, well, honey, what's, what, what's God got for us today? And you might just say, you know what, let's just, let's just sing a song. You haven't become less spiritual because you didn't open the... Oh, God help me. Hey, just say that a little bit louder. Draw near. You draw near to God. The Bible says, James, draw near or nigh unto God, he'll draw near unto you. How do I draw near? I can't, I can't let this, this once a week event be the only way I draw near to God. <clears throat> Man, I want to I wanna sow, you know, the, like the, the, the home point groups that are going on. My wife and I have been chomping at the bit to get to them because I want to I wanna get there. But the Lord hasn't given me liberty to go there because I want it to be developed from the inside out. Janice Bell Dave, and, and, and TJ and, and Kyle that helps her. These guys are going in there and they're, they're, they want y'all to come so y'all can go ahead and, and get this stuff, man, woman. You know, and, and I get it. It's not, not convenient for everybody. There's very little that I've ever done for God that's been convenient in my life to include moving to Iowa, to include moving to Iowa. Now, what am I saying with all that? I'm saying to you this. What you've come to the point now is that you, are, you and I are up against the, the, the forces of the age. And, and our enemies, they pulling out all the stops. Some of y'all don't read the news. That's your choice. But be informed. Don't be walking around here blindly like, you know, because I told you, I, told, I haven't said this in a long time, that, that when, you come to, when you come to Life Point, you have a mark on you. Especially if you say, well, I'm a partner. Oh, God, help me. Yes, Lord. The reason why Paul could say this to Peter from an authority level. Yeah, you could say they're both apostles. I get this. But Paul did not concern, was not concerned about Peter's title. He was concerned about his eternity. And many of us get caught up because we think that somebody has been saved longer than us and we ain't going to say nothing to them. We're not going to challenge them about their inconsistencies. Or we're not going to challenge them about a lack of accountability in your life. If you don't have accountability in your life, you are not ready for the kingdom. I'm preaching better than they say amen right now. This is my last story. I'm, I'm preparing y'all for the offering, so y'all need to be prepared for that, okay? That's what I'm doing. My wife, 
And I'm, I'm going to just say highlights here. The Lord led her. We hadn't been born again, I don't know, a year, maybe two. I don't know. Wasn't long at all. We didn't know nothing. But Jesus, we love you. <laughs> you know, some of y'all. And the Lord led her to somebody who was spiritually supposed to be more mature than her. Certainly had her in years as far as knowing the Bible. And it was even a teacher of the Bible. And led her to go talk to this person. Listen to me well. In private, if you're going to correct me, now you ain't Paul and I ain't Peter, so don't correct me in front of the group. <laughs> well, you know, Paul did it. You ain't Paul. I did say that, right? And I'm Peter. But if, now, if I'm out there doing it, if I'm sitting around a table and she ain't with me and I got my arms like this and there's two ladies sitting next to me, then you have every right to correct me in public. Y'all ain't saying nothing. Okay, I thought y'all too, okay. So, so, when she walked up to the lady and said to this leader, the Lord told me to tell you, that you, I'm just paraphrasing, your love walk is not where it should be. Listen, listen, this leader, <laughs> I got to come back on this side. If I could get in somebody's face, I could get in the right face. <laughs> Who you think you are? I've been born, I've been living, for, I've been a Christian longer than you have. I don't receive that. True story. That person now, mm, mm, I better stop. I'm going to stop right there. Are y'all hearing me? Yeah. Yeah. It's real simple. We can either live it or we can talk it. And when the, when the, when the rubber meets the road and the, <laughs> the stuff hits the fan because the stuff is going to hit the fan at some point in your life whether you believe it or not. Yes. Well, I ain't never had that happen, Pastor Tommy. Well, I know you're 15, so wait till you get to be about. <laughs> I know you're 22. Anything looking, everything coming up, roses. But roses die, baby. So in all that, you got to know who you are. I know who I am. It's hard for me to feel guilty about anything. I used to feel guilty about everything, Robin. You name it, I felt guilty about it. I had to pray a certain way. <laughs> I told y'all this last week, or last time I was in front of you. When you pray, and somebody said, let's pray, what's the first thing you and I do? Why do you do that? Why do you do it? Who said that? Because how you been taught. Does God not hear your prayer if your eyes are open and your head is up? You know, I'll tell you a good place not to do that is when you're driving a car. <laughs> Let's pray. Drive. Hey, 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 open your eyes. I'm messing with you, but, but, but what I'm saying to you is the same thing that happened to Peter we're susceptible to, but we don't have to be. The reason why I don't feel guilty, I mean, I'm, I do stuff wrong. I, did, I, did, I do stuff wrong. Don't ask me because you ain't going to tell. I'm not going to ask what you did. I really don't care what you did. I really don't. If I see you out there, I'm going, and it's, it's something that's, that's not like Jack. Why is Jack hitting that man over the head with his Bible? <laughs> Jack will hit him with the word, but not literally, Amen. <laughs> Praise God. But please come to a place of mind renewal. It is a process. I, I, this is my last saying as we prepare to receive our offering. If I can't get you, and we're receiving a building fund offering as well as our general, morning general fund ties and offerings. If I can't get you to change your mind, and it's not me, listen to me well. Some of y'all, and I said this a couple years ago over, over at Tiffin, and I, I don't know who will remember this. But the Lord told me to say it, and he said it this way. He said, some people that are coming to LifePoint are adding years to their life because they're coming. <laughs> are adding years and taking, taking a lot of the effort out of your life because you're coming, because you're hearing what you're hearing. That doesn't mean everybody's going to receive it, to be clear, right? We know that. And yet there's people, I don't preach anybody's funeral. I don't want to do it. But I, I've heard the Lord say, he said, there's some that have drifted away from that. They don't remember. 
And what they're doing is allowing that enemy to put pressure and stress on them. And what's the first thing that gets affected by pressure and stress in your body? Your blood pressure, your health. Your blood pressure, your heart, right? Those are the two things, primarily. Is there anything else, doctor? What else? Lungs, you know, what else? Your mind, your mind. You start going bonkers and crazy. Start thinking all crazy, foolish stuff. Don't nobody like me. They just come, they just talk about me. Ain't nobody talking about you. And people that are going somewhere don't have time to talk about people anyway. It's enough, it takes all they can to keep their own life on track. I certainly ain't got time to be talking. I ain't sitting in my bedroom talking about what you ain't doing. Amen? Stand to your feet. Amen.